Okay, welcome everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. We are so excited to welcome Joshua Whitehead to OPL. Uh, we are going to have time at the end for questions. So I just want to let you know now, please send them in the chat and we will we'll get to them at the end of uh, Joshua's talk. So I want to start by acknowledging that the Oakville Public Library is situated on the Treaty 14 and Treaty 22 treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Haudenosaunee. Oakville is currently home to many different First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Regardless of where we come from, we are all interconnected through the land that we live on, water that we use, and air that we breathe. We are committed to a continuous learning journey in allyship. We seek to elevate Indigenous voices and lived experience to cultivate reconciliation in Oakville. So part of the, uh, that journey is our community conversations series that we've been putting on throughout the year. We've had many different themes. Um, OPL understands that we are an important anchor in the community. And through the library, members of the community can experience greater awareness, access, and use of library services in ways that uniquely serve our needs. And we aim to bring these experiences together for you through our community conversation series, a collection of partnered programs, events, and resources to engage you in thoughtful discussions on social issues and polarizing topics. We'll explore these conversational themes each month. This month, we are highlighting Indigenous arts, culture, and voices, and we are so happy to welcome Joshua Whitehead. So I'm going to do a little bio, uh, and I'm sure Joshua will add to this later, but Joshua is a Two-Spirit Oji Nehiao member of the Peguas First Nation, which is Treaty One. He is a professor at the University of Calgary, where he teaches creative writing and special topics in Indigenous literatures, and cultures with a focus on gender and sexuality. And his latest book, Making Love with the Land, is a collection of narrative theory, essays, and nonfiction that explores indigeneity, queerness, and the relationships between our bodies, language, and the land. He is also the author of Full Metal Indigiqueer, which was shortlisted for the inaugural Indigenous Voices Award and the Stephen G. Stephenson Award for Poetry. He is also the author of Johnny Appleseed, which was long listed for the Giller Prize, shortlisted for the Indigenous Voices Award, the Governor General's Literary Award, the Amazon Canada First Novel Award, and the Carol Shields Winnipeg Book Award, and won the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Fiction and the Georges Bugnet Award for Fiction. And many of you might know that OPL just wrote Red, Johnny Appleseed in our book club. So we were very excited to have you with us. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it off to you, jo Joshua. Wonderful. Um, well, Tom said it to my kind, my friends. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I was just noting to Ashley that I raced back from teaching this afternoon. <laughs> I got stuck behind a train which gave me enough time to wolf down a French fry really fast. Um, I'll also note I have a German Shepherd, um, so he is currently very unhappily out behind the, like beyond this door. Um, so if you like, someone's like trying to jack Nicholson in, it's just my dog, um, who's like, I also want to be part of it. He likes to steal the spotlight from me. <laughs> and, and by that, I mean, he's like taken over um, like my like CBC articles as the picture uh, multiple times. Um, so he may make an appearance, his name is Chief. Um, <laughs> I doubt he will tonight. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited to be with you all today. Um, I was noting to Ashley, I haven't really talked about Johnny Appleseed, uh, my little glitter princess in a while. Uh, I've been so busy with my nonfiction, making love with the land, which I might share a tiny little excerpt for you tonight because I think of it as like behind the scenes, like opening the curtain uh, to see Oz, the behind the scenes of Johnny Appleseed, uh, including some of the influences, 
for the characters in Johnny Appleseed are in Making Love with the Land, as well as the reception that I received with Johnny during the promotion, but also more heightened after Canada Reads um, and winning that, like, I guess, Coliseum battle of <laughs> like literary books. Uh, but I wanted to start with a little reading tonight. Uh, and since I folks have read this for their book club, and since Johnny's kind of been out a little bit, I get to read from the end of the novel, which I never really get an opportunity to do. Um, so I'm excited. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a lot I want to go in, um, including working on adapting this to um, screen and TV. To TV. Uh, I am not a screenwriter, so it's been quite a challenge. Uh, so this is towards the end of the book. With Johnny and his mother's kind of reconciliation and coming back together. She thought I wasn't coming. When my mom opened her front door, she took hold of my whole body and lifted me off the ground in a huge bear hug. Her grip had gotten stronger since I'd last seen her. Her hair was in a messy ponytail and she wasn't wearing any makeup, but her face looked exactly as I remembered it. Hard and aged, but kind. You missed the wake, she said. I know, Mom, I'm sorry. I just didn't have the cash to return sooner. You know, shit, that old res money don't reach that far off the res, but I'm here now, right? Solid as a rock. Still got so much to do. We have to help Mabel make the dainties for the service. I still have to pick up the flowers for Roger, and I still have no idea what the fuck I'm going to wear. I grabbed her and hugged her tightly. I'll help you with all of that, I said. Are you okay? Babe, heck, I just missed you. We held each other like that for a while. Then she made us tea and ripped us a slab of bannock, which we sloppily slathered with butter and jam. I was in hell, she said in between bites. Straight up hell, John. I wanted to say me too. Tell her ain't nothing straight about hell, but instead I sliced another piece of bannock in two. He ain't never tell me it got that bad, fucking asshole, she said. I used my fork to pull the tub of margarine towards me, slid my knife into it. Who the hell does that? Who in their right mind pieces out leaving their Nietzsche-mus like that? Fucking dumbass. He'd go out with all those cousins of his day in, day out. Wake up, sip, get dressed, sip, go out, sip, come home, sleep. Repeated that shit every day, John. I didn't say anything. Just kept spreading the margarine hard across the two banner calves, spilling crumbs everywhere. I know I ain't no saint, John. I know I've been friends with that old bottle too damn long, too, but I never ever do it to whittle time. At least that's what I told myself. I spread the raspberry puree on the bannock. Next, the dark red jam oozing onto the newly formed crevices. And each time he'd come back, I'd see how time etched to him. His muscles became sandbags. His calves were thin enough for me to wrap my fucking hand around. And his whole body just went yellow as piss. I took a bite from one half of the bannock and slid the other half across to her. He looked like a goddamn skeleton, John. My old man was walking around dead as a doornail. She shook her head and pushed the bannock aside. And he tells me, Karen, ain't nothing no hospital's gonna do. Fuck, I go there with strep throat and they ask me, you drunk, boy? Ain't nothing they're going to do. Ain't no one ever going to give a liver to an Indian who's already punched out. Mama's curls fell across her face, hiding her. But her eyes peeked through, making her look feral, wounded, sad as a fox stuck in a hunter's trap. Said to me, Karen, it's my time. It ain't nothing wrong with that. And I said to him, you don't get to sit there and talk to me about wrongdoing. You, the one who let time fuck him up the ass royally. You don't get to sit there and look at me with that pitiful face, looking like you, the only Indian who ever been hurt. My dear mama, I wanted to say, when did you become an owl caged in on all sides? This ain't fucking fair, John. This ain't fucking fair at all. Her body caved in on itself, but the veins in her arms rose up and showed the royal blue blood that beat and beat and beat inside her. He never let me call no one, saying it ain't my business, telling me this is his fight, that he know a thing or two about scrapping with death. I got up and wrapped my arms around her from behind. And when he went and I lost me, Josh, John, I lost me real good. Feels like I ain't got nobody left. 
Why everyone got to leave me here to rot in this fucking hellhole, John? You got me, I said. And I'm not ever leaving, Mama. I rested my chin on her shoulder and we both stared into the distant corner of our kitchen. Remember when you told me that neither of us were never supposed to survive birth? I said. She nodded and grasped my arm. You told me, John, you, your mama, we ain't the lie down type and die. We're survivors. That C-section or that pneumonia ain't gonna take me and it sure as hell I'm gonna take you, John. The doctor said we had a week max and then come to three, a month, a year, and then now. And you sure as hell better believe we got tomorrow. You remember that, Mama? You told me, never forgot you were the born of Grandmother Earth. Boy, you, the one who made me crave mud all the while I was pregnant with you. And I picture you sometimes, Mama, sitting out there in the bush, dress soiled, all that dirt, painting your fingers black, and you there, hair in a glorious braid running down your back, digging your hands into that dark brown flesh. Then you scoop out the guts of the earth and you swallow ceremoniously, dead mud slopping down your mouth and chest. And just smiling, Mama. You happy as all hell out there in the bush with your, book, with your belly full of cooka mesqui or Mother Earth. And I picture that earth wrapping itself around our umbilical cord, cook them there kissing us in the bathwater of your womb. Mama laid her head on the table and broke down, dissolving into a yelping cry. I pressed myself against her and cried into her hair. I remember, my boy, she said. I told you when you left that we hardened ourselves to the world back then. That old grandmother earth gifted us a shell by wrapping around the braid that maintains us. We're both born from a wound. We held each other there for what seemed like a lifetime after that. We were both so fucking helpless in our nostalgia, so heavy with our sadness. When you really let yourself feel, well, you end up hurting yourself from all that scare. And then I'm just gonna jump to another little passage towards the end as well, um, between Johnny uh, and Tias, his lover slash best buddy. <laughs> I remember the first time Tias told me that he loved me. All I could say in response was, aw, oh, well, hi, hi, thank you. His sheets had lost their grip from the corners of his mattress and were twisted around our thighs. His back was mucked with sweat and love juice. It felt like the marshlands at Okamak. The bone spur in his shoulder was poking out as he raised himself off me and held my legs against his chest. Bone so sharp it looked as if it might pierce through his flesh. It was when he came that he said, I love you. I didn't, couldn't respond. Kukum always said that saying Gisa Gipin, or I love you, was a summoning of a living being and Manitou knows I ain't fit to be no mother. Plus, what the hell does that even feel like, love? I'm not sure if I will ever feel it. I just know that when Tias leaves to go back to Jordan, I will feel that pain in my belly, a pain that just sits there heavy, hurting, whittling down as slowly as a cigarette. We lay in that bed for a while, me telling him about a new convenience store I found down in Osborne that sells cigarettes dirt cheap. He was listening as he always did, quietly, while I laid my head on his chest, his rib cage about as comfortable as a pile of remotes. Tias, always trying to be the stoic Indian. My eyes fell on a photo of his sister on a table across from the bed, the sister he lost. Hey, T, tell me a little more about your sister, I said, if you're up to it. I could feel his steadiness break right away. He sat up, the sheets sheathed around him like he was some aerial silk dancer. It was a thorny subject. The story of his sister was buried deep within him. Beneath a layer of sediment that had hardened into a gallstone, all cholesterol and jagged pain. It was then that I decided that love sounded more like a full stop than a semicolon, and I moved too much like water. They took her away that day, in that away car, he said. His body wilted like a deflated balloon. Took me too. Spirit anyway. You think you know what loneliness feels like, John? I wanted to say, yeah, I think so. 
When I'm feeling alone, sometimes I down a beer and conjure up ghosts to keep me company because they ain't running up your monthly minutes. Can't even begin to tell you how many times I dreamed her, how many times I could still feel her tiny fist into my hand. My parents used to say that they saved me from myself, you know? Like my real family ain't ever been fit to keep me. It's just, you ever feel... His voice was low in his throat, so low that it faded into the air as soon as it came out of his mouth, so that only the dead could hear him speaking. You ever feel like you ain't even here anymore? I lit a cigarette and positioned myself behind him, cradling him with my legs, holding the cigarette in front of his lips so he could take the drag too. Like, you're just shambling through the days, repeating what you've already done, he continued. Like... Life is all a blur and a ball of iron. I placed my ear against his back, fitting into the groove of his spine, his heart pumping adrenaline and memory, his heartbeat fierce like a beaver slapping its tail. I can feel her, you know, tucked away behind the little parasack in my stomach, like a goddamn fruit bowl that's gone moldy. And I'm sure there are bugs that eat from it too, I know. I see them cling to each other in a pile when I throw up after a rager. And when I go out and look at all these people smiling and shopping, holding their goddamn kids' hands in parks, I wonder if they feel this too. Or did I just inherit this from my dad who drank until his throat rotted and gave up and said, fuck the air I breathe, I'm going to breathe in the dirt. Tias could nurse his hurt like it was the most precious baby in the world. But he fed it too much, birthed it into toilets, and spewed it into the streets. He was a poet when he was sad, I thought. All those words sharp like calligraphy. He got up and went over to the picture of his sister, flecks of ash falling from his burning skin. He picked it up and stared at it. I feel like I'm a goddamn prisoner sometimes, like I've been locked away all my life while she's out there growing up and living hers without me he said, rubbing his eyes. And I don't even know if my baby sister is still alive. There he was, the boy beneath the surface, the one I loved who hid himself beneath sand and ash and all kinds of dead stories. Tias was woven like a spider web, all curious, all tangled, all sticky in corners, but dazzling in the center where the light shone through and coalesced around every cranny. My sad boy, lover, all sullen and defeated, the charm utterly broken, afraid, dead cold and stern as all hell, like that old painter we used to study, Waterhouse. He looked at me. You think she ever thinks about me, John? You think she ever stops and says, I wish my brother were here? I nodded, silent. This type of hurt was not mine to know. But then again, it was. I do, I finally replied. I know it. How you know for sure? I pulled him back into the bed, lay his head in my lap. He could talk himself to death, that boy. I pricked my fingers as they grazed the sides of his head where his hair was buzzed, then ran them over to the top where his hair clumped together in dirty curls. I pulled it straight, the loose hair shaking like a pine tree in a spring windstorm. I thought, this here is how I know we're still alive, T. There's a whole world grown on top of your old head, but he had fallen asleep by then. I know, my boy, because you're the best damn person I ever met, I said, if only to myself. <laughs> and I'll share a small little excerpt from this, which is, like I was saying, behind the scenes. Um, but thinking about bodies and thinking about writing and thinking about connection and where a story comes from. I'm always saying all my books are sibling stories. And I'm always saying my body, this body, I have this little zipper of skin, and this body of text and the bodies of water and bodies of land that we are all on or visit or drink from, we're all interconnected. Um, but we're like, we're like umbilical. We're like regurgitant birds feeding each other. So I feed the books and they feed me. Uh, and that's how bodies nourish each other and stay in connection and kinship. Much as the land feeds me, much as the waters nourish me with, with water to drink. Um, so that's all in connection. 
it was in Johnny, um, but I never really put it into words. I was just writing it into being, I suppose. Um, so this one, a short excerpt I'll read here, um, is kind of behind the scenes of Johnny and his lover, best friend, Tias, where that comes from. It's called Me, the Joshua Tree. You and I share a secret place in Calgary, the Inglewood Irrigation Canal that is a few kilometers from our home. I show you this place one day when we go for a walk, tell you how I would run to the dog park and down along the canal while exercising, often stopping to wade my hands to the cold waters. In turn, you show me a place beyond the canal where the railroads cut across Bow Sapi or Bow River. After the annihilation leading to the death of our relationship has begun, we walk down to the canal after a weekend of stewing and depression. It's a beautiful Sunday. The sim sun is there above us, massaging our shoulders until they brown. As they stride along a path, I stop and ask, do you hear that? And you say, oh, it must be from the golf course nearby. I have stopped us because I hear voices almost from beneath as if they were in the catacombs of the canal. A whimpering, maybe, an exaltation. What are the trees whispering to us in this moment? What are the rocks? What are the water? We continue on this path you have walked many times, a handful of them to escape me after I've hurt you through words weaponized, and you take me to the clearing. As we continue through the clearing, we come across a jutting of land and an openness of water. Bo Sipi is here, greets us through its steady rocking. Sometimes a wave is a wave. There are duck feathers strewn about, a carcass and a fire pit here in this little outcrop of land that believes it is a cliff. You say, someone has been here, caught a duck looks like, and I think, I'm just so happy that they used everything. We sit on the edge smoking cigarettes. You skip rocks across the lake, as I run my hands through the water, sift my fingers through the silt. This whole journey reminds me of the film Stand By Me, which is one of my favorites. I feel like I am Gordy Lachance, and here you are, Chris Chambers. In this vignette I play in my head, I imagine us having started that fire, roasted that duck, slept here in the tall grasses, let Sapi sing us to sleep. I'll ask, do you think I'm weird? And you'll say, Definitely. But so what? Everybody's weird. And in that moment, my belly will bloom because this is a moment I have craved since I was a child, latched on to the ghost of Gordy Lachance. I live through the intimacy I share with characters whose lives I have imagined. We'll talk into the night, that kind of talk that seems important until, as Lachance narrates, you discover girls. Of course, we have discovered girls. But in this moment, we are also just two queer prairie boys discovering one another and the landscape around us and how our bodies are now braids separated and called for the smudging. How easy is intimacy, honesty, truth, when in a dream or when separated? How we grind into one another, spark flints for the fire we let die and feast through the blaze we create here now in this moment as individuals. In this vignette, I hear you say, by which I mean, I hear myself saying, I wish that I could go someplace where nobody knows me. We have come here to see a body, which doesn't exist because this is a vignette, but we have come nonetheless. And so what I offer up is bodies in multiplicity, the river body, the earthen body, a pocket of air, a breast of rock, bicep of branch, me, you, us, we witness death here too, though in a different fashion from the film, more holistic than nihilistic, that continuum where death kisses birth, and is there ever such a concept as division? I think I'll leave that there. <laughs> a small little peek. Um, yeah, so I wanted to kind of talk a little bit with you folks, and I'm about the book, or, um, about the books actually, uh, but Johnny specifically, and then have a conversation with, I'm interested to hear what you thought with your book clubs, uh, but also just what you think in general. Um, and yeah, any insights that you might have or inquiries, um, concerns, <laughs> you tell me. Um, 
so Johnny was actually began in, so I started writing in 2017, um, right after I had just finished uh, Full Metal and Digiqueer, which is a book about a cyborg trickster, the book of poetry that's more like prose poems, uh, a cyborg trickster who's kind of like a virus, um, an amalgamation of uh, tricksters like Nanabush um, and Wendigo, uh, who are like the shapeshifters, the cannibals, um, Okimao Nape, or Okimao, um, I'm going to forget the name now. Apigesis, um, the trickster spider who spun the original World Wide Web, as indigenous people say, a connection across Turtle Island through trade routes or through kinship systems or through intertribal or inter sovereign national um, trading or connection. And so he's like a cyborg. <laughs> he's like infecting the canon at all times to recenter indigeneity and texts that appropriate indigeneity. Um, from Shakespeare through to RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh, so it's a very mechanical, if you like cyberpunk, it's very much in that realm of like maybe indigenous cyberpunk <laughs> in the form of poetry of all forms. And I had these beach poems in it. And so I was working with Nishka poet uh, Jordan Abel. Folks might know his work, Nishka, which is most recent um, nonfiction foray, but also the place, place of Scraps, Injun, which won the Griffin Poetry Prize. And he was like, Josh, we can't have this, this book is so mechanical, it's so cybernetic, it's so um, interconnected in that way. And then all of a sudden you have these like langorious, beautiful, sensual beach poems that just don't fit. So it's like, you need to kind of call them out. And I am not one for killing my darlings um, as writing likes to tell us to do. So you should, if one day, maybe like, oh, post it or like posthumously someone can go through all my files and notes I save every single thing I write and do even if I don't use it but I always find it comes back so these beach poems I had four or five of them um and I had to do this kind of proposal to enter this class which was called 100 pages in 100 days it was as wild as it sounds <laughs> which was taught by fellow Alberta writer uh, Aretha Van Herc when I was still in my course studies so I had these poems and didn't know what to do with them. I had to make this proposal as to submit um, for a portfolio. And like speaking of never killing my darlings, Johnny was a, a character I've had with me for like well over a decade, even longer now, um, in that I was in my like early teenage years, early twenties, late teens. And I was like very, 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 I still am, I still love them, but I was very obsessed with the beatniks at that time. Um, and I thought they were like bringing back orality to poetry, which they definitely were, but they did not invent, <laughs> as I am more um, keen to say now. But I loved like Jack Kerouac, William Burroughs, I loved Allen Ginsberg, but I also loved those who were lesser known, um, like the beatnik women, uh, the BIPOC beatniks, like Albert Saijo, there's an amazing book of poetry called Rhapsody. And so, yeah, I was like, in my early, late teens, early 20s, writing this novel, which never became a novel, uh, but it was called The Concrete Poets. It was about these kind of like beatnik kids who were all indigenous, who lived in my small town, South Creek, Manitoba, which is just outside of Winnipeg. And they were pool hall sharks, and they were hustlers, and they were existentialist philosophers, I suppose you could say, in the in same vein of On the Road. And basically, they, they would meet at the pool hall like every weekend, and maybe even more than weekends, and hustle everyone and get free beer from that. And then just all go back to this house and like smoke weed all night, <laughs> like have these existential conversations, um, which was like, okay, I'm like, this is a retired trope uh, of narrative. Um, and I had this tertiary character, like a third person removed from the protagonist, who was this kind of very like Thompson Highway inspired fur queen, um, but you know, who's like wearing these drapes of fur that they got from vintage stores and was like high femme with, you know, painted nails and jewelry, very like Freddie Mercury meets maybe Kiss of the Fur Queen, um, who was just there in the background at all times and was like one of the most existentialist speakers at these after parties. Um, and so like that book never worked. <laughs> just, I could never make it make it the cogs start moving. So I couldn't find the motor of the book. Um, but the character, this kind of third tertiary character, this kind of Freddie Mercury fur queen <laughs> was very indigenous, very femme, but very philosophical. 
uh, was named Johnny. Um, so I had flash forward now to me making this portfolio. I had these beach poems and I had this character, Johnny, who had kind of lived within me like umbilically, but also like, not like a parasite, maybe more like a fattening leech, um, taking stories from me, um, making them his own, like forcing me to like dream as his character multiple times. And I swear, as much as I call him, he's such a diva, he still is. He like loves when I get to read from the book, I swear. Uh, I talk about him in the third person all the time. because <laughs> He's kind of akin to me. Now I just know him so well as a person, as a character, um, like, you know, from crown to sole of the foot. I know everything in between. And he, I swear, he just like sashayed right into these poems and was like, give me a shot. Um, so I'm like, okay, like, well, I remember this character. I have all my notes. Let me pull them out. And like, it just became all like so naturally that he entered these beach poems. And so you might remember from Johnny Appleseed, the beach poems with him and T.S. when they're like kind of first discovering each other, first coming into their bodies and their sexualities. They're like reenacting Titanic at Grand Beach in Manitoba, if you've ever been there. And that was the portfolio. <laughs> so I had to flesh out 100 pages. Um, and, you know, it just naturally unfurled. And I'm not one to be like romantic in the sense that I think I'm like this literary muse who's just transcribing what, you know, like the muses say uh, in a very kind of romantic fashion of, you know, writers. I also am not a person who is like a solitary writer as writers like The Lost Generation thought. So, you know, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, um, Gertrude Stein, who all kind of wrote in this solitary fashion, uh, like Old Man at the Sea, just getting drunk on whiskey all night and writing rambling into his book, which I'm sorry if you love Man in the Sea, but it's not for me. <laughs> I find it quite boring. Um, so I write very really communally. Um, so. I like, you know, I'm always listening and I'm always reading. And so I think I kind of work in a, like, kind of like that web, that web um, moving outwards and everything's connected from things people have told me and things I've experienced and things I've dreamed of and stories I've shared and stories I've listened to and stories I've overheard. I'm a bit of a, there's two things that we like, we love to say, I'm, I'm sure people have heard like you're, you're nosy. You're always like in the other people's business. And then great people, especially in Southern Manitoba, we like to say Mukatoon, M-U-C-K-T-O-O-N, which means like you talk so much, you're so verbose, you're always never shutting up, which I think those two things put together, you become a natural storyteller. <laughs> if you're nosy and you never stop talking. And so, yeah, I, Johnny kind of unfurled naturally from that. And, you know, he became a novella at first, 100, about 110 pages. Um, and then I had won this stay uh, from Full Metal in the Banff Writer Center, um, which is one of my favorite places to go. Uh, if you're a writer, emerging, new, established, it's a magical place to be writing in. Um, but the Blackfoot also say you're not supposed to stay overnight. Um, so it does, you, you, people get like, not, like maybe because it's the altitude, but I think it's actually a Black, it's a ceremonial Blackfoot space where you can have like wild, intense dreams at night. So I was there for a week writing to the wee hours of the night, like 12 hour days, 13 hour days. I just felt like possessed to finish this book in this week, which I did. Um, but it was like very, people call Johnny Apple the fever dream. <laughs> it's like very much a fever dream, writing nonstop all day, every day, exhausted every night. I'm realizing I hadn't eaten in seven hours. Um, and yeah, like chain smoking cigarettes in the back of this little cabin I was staying in in Bath <laughs> and naturally unfurled. But the space also granted me a lot of these like very wild dreams. Um, so this, when I was touring with Johnny, everyone's favorite request was, please read the bear scene. Um, and I was like, okay, <laughs> the weirdest dream of, I guess, bestiality really in the form of uh, Marion Engel's bear, if you've ever read that book. Uh, when I was like, I can do this too. But that was an actual unnatural dream that I had. There's an apocalyptic dream that I wrote in Johnny that I had there where he's on the back. He becomes Nana Bush and his dream is on the back of this Thunderbird. And the world has ended, is ending. And there's just like this huge tsunami coming. And they kind of interconnect. He gets on the back. Um, and they like crest, they move to this crest and they're like beaten and battered and bloody thinking they had made it. And then they just see endless and then this waves coming. They kind of just... 
I would say, um, surrender at that point um, to the to the ultimate doom of the destruction of the world that you know we humans have caused. Um, capitalism and colonization has propelled further uh, and I guess uh, expedited. And there's also a dream at the end of Johnny um, where his grandmother says to his mother, you're gonna have a dream about Johnny uh, in which he's spearfishing and he's told he's not supposed to because he's too girly to be spearfishing with the men. Which is also another dream I had in Bam. And so like everything quickly, quickly, quickly came. And then Johnny had become the novel that he is today, really. And then I submitted to Arsenal Pulp because I was just, with, I was with Talon Books um, for Full Metal, but they don't really do novels or prose. And Arsenal Pulp had just, this was about 2017, 2018. Uh, Arsenal Pulp had, Raziel Reed had won a Governor General's Literary Award for children's fiction with When Everything Feels Like the Movies. And it became this huge controversy across Can Canadian literature and Canada um, that a book that features a queer child who has queer desires uh, and queer love could win a book that's for children. Um, so Barbara Kay, John Kay, the Voldemorts uh, of Canlit, um, had written these scathing ar arguments and wanting to rescind the award, saying it was um, not appropriate that we be talking about these things. Um, meanwhile, you know, we have many of ch many a children's book that features <laughs> heterosexual desire. Um, and Arsenal Pulp had defended it so brilliantly and so beautifully um, that I knew Johnny Appleseed was going to be a natural fit there. So I you know, submitted it in. I thought I had finished this book. <laughs> Brian Lamb, who works with Arsenal Pulp, bless his heart, um, was like, Joshua, like the John has not really had any moment with that kind of an ending moment um, with his grandmother. And I was like, I, the book is finished. I was still very green writer than that. Uh, I was like, the book is done. What are you talking about? Um, so he challenged me to like rewrite an ending. Um, and the ending became uh, when Johnny like visits his grandmother's grave on the reservation after finally returning home. Um, and in the shadow, his shirt looks like a hand holding out as it stretches across the road uh, in kind of the sunset, which became the ending of Johnny. And so like that was kind of like the whole chrysalis stage of this little glitter princess, diva, butterfly, whatever Johnny is. Um, but yeah, I guess like what I like, why I like to share that story is for anyone who's interested in writing or story or even just journaling, it's like such a wild experience to like hold on to those and to keep them, to archive them, um, maybe just for your own personal use or maybe for creative uses. Because even now, like reading this, even sharing with you today, those sections, I feel like I'm always kind of being gifted back from Johnny. Uh, in all ways, shape, and form. There's been times when I was a grad student in which I was like, well, I can barely afford rent for this month. So either I pay rent or <laughs> like eat ramen for another two weeks, um, or you know, I have to find something else to kind of another freelance job to do. And Johnny would always be like, I got you. And like that was, this royalty check would come that would get me through another month or two. But also like the beautiful thing about what I mean, like Johnny's always giving back and those old stories teach me things even now. Um, there's a line in Johnny, which was kind of the motor of this book, Making Love with the Land, or a big part of it, which was kind of why I wrote it. And in which Johnny is talking with his cookum or his grandmother in the book, and she tells him that a humility is just a humiliation you love so much it transformed. And I remember reading that like 2019 when I started Making Love with the Land. I was like, who the hell wrote that? Like, I I don't remember writing that. Um, so I was like, oh, like, I'm like still learning from my characters. And it's something like real life too. Um, so the section that I wrote or read to you from Making Love with the Land, it's called Me the Joshua Tree, is like uh, the death of like a very long-term relationship in my life in which this, this the, all the care, everyone in Making Love with the Land besides myself is referred to just as you for anonymity's sake um but it was a huge blow um this you in that story this ex long-term partner was like was very uh fundamental to helping me write johnny appleseed um it was insp inspirational but also a great editorial help to me throughout it all and so 
we had broken up at this space, space and time. I was a complete mess. I had no idea COVID was about to happen. <laughs> so I wish I had not started writing a book about mental health right before a pandemic. Um, maybe it's beneficial now, but <laughs> time is very difficult. And so, yeah, we had to do the audiobook for Johnny Appleseed, me and his previous partner, which we had signed this contract like seven months ago, being like, oh, we'll totally do it. And I was dreading the whole thing. We, had, we weren't speaking at this point and we were both wounded, and <laughs> like very combative, not competitive with each other. We had drawn this like imaginary divisionary line across Calgary being like, do not cross it. This is my part of the city. Um, and so we had to come together to do this audiobook. And it was just wild to me too, doing this audiobook for a week, which you know features there are parts in Johnny Appleseed which are very personal to both of us. And reading them aloud together through the voice of Johnny and being, I forgot I wrote this scene. I forgot I wrote about this like small little detail that is very intimate and personal to us. After the whole week, we would every day for the week, we would like read a small section of the book and you have to repeat it over and over and over. Each line needs about 16, 17 times to read it through. So you have different inflections. And during the time we were both a complete mess, like our poor audio manager <laughs> was just like, he was my director and I was in the soundproof booth and I would read a passage which might affect him. Uh, and then we were both like crying like every 40 minutes. And I'm sure the audio director was like, what is going on with these two in this booth right now? And so, yeah, like, throughout that week, we would, we would kind of go back to debrief and decide what we're gonna do the next day, trying to be so professional. It ended up becoming quite personal to use Johnny as the mediator for both of us to kind of rekindle our friendship and like reconceptualize who we are as people, and then ultimately to forgive and thank each other. And so again, I was just like this character who's been with me for so long, and I had shared all these stories with him, and he had kind of taken some trauma of my stories and made them beautiful and turned humiliation into humility. Uh, it's given me back financially, but emotionally, and it's kind of continued to guide me even into making love with the land uh, and into the next novel project that I'm working on as, oh, well, I guess I can tell that now, uh, now, that, now that I'm not in fiction, so, uh, I'm working on a new novel. Um, so yeah, it's just like wild to me, like the power of character, um, when you allow them to be kin uh, and you allow story to be animate, uh, and when you put breath to word, you breathe it into being. Just how fundamentally powerful a story can be uh, and how transformational a character can become um, and how we as readers, when we enter the world and kind of the body of the writer, but the text that they've made, when we guest ourselves into that, we build this like beautiful, beautiful relationship and kinship with the characters and the plot and the metaphors and the novels. And I really think of like novels and stories, not just novels, but nonfiction and poetry and stories in general as like medicinal in the sense that I am a huge fan of like Toni Morrison. I return to Beloved continually almost every year. I'm a huge fan of Cormac McCarthy as well. The road I, as abysmal as it is, uh, I return to that once a year, which I actually think like The Road is like Cormac McCarthy's like happiest book, um, which might be <laughs> it's such a beautiful story about a father and son, which are not sometimes father and son, and who mirror each other. And it, like they're like a plant, right? Like a medicinal plant. And you, you know, you just snip off what you need at certain different times in your life and it continues to bloom. Um, so if you never rip the roots out, you can always come back to it. Uh, and you'll always find something different at different stages in your life, emotionally, or in terms of age, or in terms of circumstance. And yeah, what an overwhelming, divine, miraculous thing stories are. And I guess like, yeah, that's kind of the story of Johnny Appleseed with me today. Um, I guess this one, one last note, like I was noting, we're working on the screenplay of this. He's being adapted into television. Um, I do have some, like I have an NDA saying, but I can talk basic things. It's been a wild trip uh, of like crafting a novel into a series, uh, a mini series that it has ideation of continuation into multiple stories. Um, so it's fun for me to return to this book at a different time in my life in which things are kind of healed and reconciled 
and to like look at it from a perspective of like director really um or as a screenwriter or like how to expand so it's like very exciting for me to like think of characters who i love um, but i just kind of had to like call back a little bit for the sake of keeping the spotlight on the kind of four main characters of this book who are johnny tius his cook and his mother um i love jordan um she is what well, she thinks she's a very badass representative who's kind of tia they're kind of like a love triangle more on tia's side uh, in the book they end up becoming pregnant and that becomes like the rupture between johnny and tia's but we're getting to like reimagine her and fill up her life stories and peggy like the hustler smuggler um <laughs> it's really been fun to kind of reimagine her and then characters who are like very, very peripheral. Um, I wanted Johnny Appleseed to be very focused on the women in his life, the queer folks in his life, the feminine in his life. So I had to kind of dial back of who's Johnny's father was. The book really kind of talks to him about being, thinking he was like uh, Johnny Cash and took off on the road as a musician and never came back. Uh, or Johnny's stepfather, Roger, who I have a love-hate relationship. He's very <laughs> vitriolic. He's very violent at times. It's also very gifting. Um, there's a scene where Johnny has like this um, belly button or on this wood tick in his belly button and like thinks he's gonna have a baby. Um, and you know, Roger helps him through that and helps him through small moments of which he's being bullied. So it's kind of fun to like round out these characters as well. So yeah, thank you for a treat. It's a wild ride, it's a different ride, but it's the same core mechanics. <laughs> so what a journey from 2018 to 2022 um, with the glitter princess known as Johnny Appleseed. I hope you found some medicine in him too. Um, I hope you found a rock and a whole lot of medicine actually to rupture something and to heal it in its place. And yeah, I'm just like very excited to to chat with you folks for a while here now. <laughs> I don't know, I just spewed a lot at you really, really fast. Um, I told you I'm a marketing when I talk a lot. Um, so I will dial back and I'm excited to talk with you folks. Amazing. Oh, that was, I feel like I have so much that I can go off because you gave us a lot there. Um, so everybody, I mentioned before, if you have questions, please send them in the chat. Uh, but I'm very happy to start us off. I did want to note, I thought it was so interesting that when you were doing your first reading, I don't know if it was a Freudian slip, but you said Josh and then you're like, oh, Johnny. <laughs> Yeah, which I've been talking about that a lot because in Making Love with the Land, I talked about a lot of interviewers and like previous lovers in my life after the long-term one would confuse me for Johnny. And I think I've been talking about some of them. Now I'm yeah. starting to do it. So the, I guess the book needs to be rewritten. <laughs> rewritten. <laughs> so for me, one of the one of the things I really came away with after finishing Johnny, it just felt so visceral to me like it felt very much in the body like you were mentioning um you know you're very interested in those connections between the body and the land but and our stories but like the 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 scenes that last with me are like the fingernails being trimmed off or or Tia's hair being pulled out um or even in the in the the two excerpts you just read you know very body related in like a shrinking dying body or two lovers in their bodies um mm -hmm. but a lot of it is very painful and I'm not sure if I'm getting the quote exactly right but I think there's one point where you said an Indian love you sounds like I'm in pain with you mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, also, I'm like, where did that quote come from? Like, <laughs> oh, 2018, Joshua gives new, different things that I knew, I think, that yeah. I know now. Yeah. I think what I like to do, and this is what I teach my students too, is, and this is something I learned from writing this book, because when I was writing it, uh, it was something that I, I had not seen a whole lot of like two spirit or queer indigenous representation in novels. Um, and specifically, like, I guess like younger adult novels. Mm -hmm. So actually Johnny was supposed to be a young adult, um, but <laughs> the published the Arsenal, I guess, uh, we had decided to make it a novel, but the aesthetics of the book, um, kind of the brevity of the chapters was supposed to mimic YA. So we could kind of maintain a bright, a wider audience. And there was something that, um, that 
fall, the Festival of Literary Diversity, which I think is in Brampton, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, it's a beautiful, beautiful literary festival. And I was there one year and Eden Robinson was giving a talk and she had said something along the lines of, I'm paraphrasing now, it's been a while, but like, if you don't see yourself in the literary landscape, then you just have to become that yourself. Oh. And I was like, yeah, okay, uh, I can try that. And so I started writing Johnny with that in mind of just representation, but also wanting to show the viciousness of queer indigeneity, um, but the, the vivacity of it all, how profound it is, but also how profane it can be. And I, so I had this very small audience in mind. I only thought it was gonna be read by like the queer indigenous community, the two-spirit community, uh, mm -hmm. maybe indigenous peoples and maybe just like queer folks who were interested in learning about that. I thought the window was gonna be very tiny. I never imagined I would be where Johnny would be where he is today. Mm -hmm. And like, I guess what I learned from that is that like when you like work like a director and you have a wide you have a wide lens and you're like in the whole landscape when you really really focus in on the very minuscule which is what i was doing politically but also stylistically with that book the personal the very minute details actually were the most universal bits of the book and it's funny in thinking about you know wanting to write for a universal audience where you know you could have you're going to reach kind of everyone and who's interested um, in novels rather than people who are just like, well, I'm interested in indigenous queer novels, which is a very small niche market. Um, yeah, the most intimate details, how a chicken pox scar can tell the longevity of a childhood um, or how a patch of missing hair tells the story of being a woman on a reservation or how a wound holds in it multiplicity of stories um and so like those small little details like the smallest little things like a widow's peak um which i do have um or you know a fingernail scar or like uh like a chicken park scar also comes up a broken clavicle those to me focusing on them are so universal and they're so wide they're so full of story they're a bowl holding everything um and if you can like focus in on that there's, that's all you really need you don't need yeah. to have to build this whole game of thrones world that has you know multiplicity like kingdoms upon kingdoms actually the kingdom is you have the kingdom and it's embedded in the skin it's embedded yeah. in the body uh, and it's built into the unconscious and i think it's just our job to put language to things that we know intimately but we don't have language for and put that into the book uh, like, you know, when you come across a book or a film and there's something that you you know so profoundly and so intimately and so it's so important to you, um, maybe it's a sensation or a feeling, uh, maybe it's trauma or maybe it's love or joy and someone says something to you and you're like, yeah, you just put language to what I was meaning. Like that little click right there, I think is like the beauty of storying. It's like, because you knew that unconsciously. And sometimes, yeah, it's have to kind of put language to it. And so I think the focusing in on the smallest details is both universal and opens up language to like rich veins. Um, like the little tiniest little tendrils are the rich ones uh, rather than the, you know, the grandfather tree. So yeah, I think that's what Johnny taught me. That's what I try to teach my, my students now is like focusing in on the, the minute is universal. It's so rich. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you're literally going from this, you know, it was a novella to a novel. You thought it would be, reach a very like distinct small community. And now it's going to be in a TV show. Like it's just <laughs> yeah. outwards. Um, we do have some questions that came through the chat. So I'm really excited. Um, uh, so you said some many profound things and it's hard to pick my <laughs> favorites. Example, I need my books and they feed me. It feels like interconnectedness is the core of everything. I know I would like to have more of that in my life. Any suggestions for how to do that better? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think in a Cree, I think it comes naturally to me because um, like in a Cree language or Nehio even, um, we don't have genders in our language. We also don't have proper nouns. Um, so nothing is ever owned. So you can't put like Joshua's apostrophe s book or joshua's desk or his home or his bedroom or his, this is my office but his his room 
you can have ownership in that sense. Um, and unlike, instead of that, we, we have things we call animations. Um, so instead of being like conjugating a verb to be like, I own this desk, you would conjugate it to translate it to English back. Um, the desk and I are in relation. Um, so for example, like rocks and trees, um, the sky, rivers, the plants, the four, like the winged, you know, the aquatic, the fungi. When we speak about them in a Cree fashion, we speak about them in ways that we are in continually in relation with them. Um, so like when you, I guess the best example I could give is from a Cree worldview, when you step outside and, you know, the sun's hitting you beautifully and the wind is just the lightest breeze and, you know, it's the middle of summer and the flowers are blooming and there's ants around you and there's like weeds cracking through the concrete and everything is just alive. And Kim Tallbearer says this best, who's an amazing scholar um, slash writer. She says that we're always in a polyamorous relationship whenever we step on a foot of, on a foot of piece of land or on a foot of land, because you're in relation to every single thing around you. And I think we all did that, really, maybe consciously or not. Uh, you know, in the lockdown periods, you know, when everyone was at the height of mental crises and mental health, uh, and we were all, you know, intimacy and touch starved, and you know, the everyday became almost like imprisoning or death so detrimental. And we we're in a groundhog day, and the quotidian or the everyday was just everything was just removed. Um, and none of us had prepared for that, obviously. And so what did we do? Uh, we would so be so burned out by these pixels, right? Um, are the four corners of our home. So we, like, again, like the, I think what a lot of us or most of us did was we went outside, like we went for walks. And I think the silver lining uh, of the lockdown period of COVID was that it allowed everyone to not only connect virtually, which was amazing and beautiful, but also to like reconnect to the landscapes around us. Uh, you know, going for walks, or you know visiting waterways or going to the river or you know like enjoying winter uh, as much as we can because it's, it's cold as heck in some of the prairies and i know it's cold there um but we got to like that was our connectivity and so like as lonely and as intimate intimacy starved as we were when we went outside all of that was we were so intimate and we were anything but alone in those spaces uh, with or without people around because everything, we were in relationship with every single thing and we kind of needed that. Everyone was, I think, well, I can't speak for everyone, but I'd say a good majority of us needed that relationship. And so I think, yeah, like when, you know, I would, you would go outside in the lockdown period and seeing everyone just kind of reconnecting with the land and, you know, the memes that were going around the land's healing, but, you know, animals returning into Venice and whatnot. I think we got the smallest little glimpse of, what a decolonial world could look like if we could reconceptualize our connectivity to the land bases and the bodies of it, bodies of land and water and the air and the sky and everything around it. I mean, we got to, if we could like reconnect that to connection rather than ownership, we would be just in this plethora of relation. And I think mental health across the board would improve. Um, and I think we would all be more rested and more full if we could, if that had continued, not the lockdowns, and we don't want to be locked down, um, but <laughs> if we got to maintain that that semblance of connectivity, um, that you know how the world works. Instead, we were like quickly propelled right back into the Zoom capitalism of working nine to five and being so so readily available at all times that it was like shut down right, in that sense. But I would say, in terms of how suggestions of how to do it better, if you can like bring yourself back to that moment when you stepped outside in the middle of a lockdown, what that felt like. I think if you can try to practice at least, maybe, or try to get back to a feeling like that, I think that's a great way to think about interconnectivity. Yeah, yeah, I remember because, you know, I live in a condo, I felt very closed in. Just this uh -huh. gratefulness, this gratitude for when I went outside and I had this open space and I could run or walk and, even though it was alone time, it was still a very connected, healing type of feeling being outside. It was, right? It was like overwhelming. <laughs> and we don't need to rush out of it. 
<laughs> I mean, it's nice to be able to be with other people, but to try and keep that appreciation for, you know, that interconnectedness and the different ways you can, you can do that. Um, so another question is, thank you for being here. I wondered if you could speak about the way you wove time through the narrative. Time felt very circular, and I had the same feeling when I read Monkey Beach, like the past and the present are always happening at the same time. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to have to keep using COVID metaphors. <laughs> but an indigenous way of knowing, at least a Cree one, is... So if you've ever seen a sweat lodge, it's like a circle, but it, it never closes because that's where you would enter, right? <laughs> or exit. Um, so the circle is always, it's almost like an Ouroboros, uh, except nothing's eating each other. It's just like the same thing, just there's no snake heads. Um, there's no snake head or tail, it's just like an entrance. And it's so like, that's how it, at least my people conceptualize life and death is that like you're an infant and then you kind of go through life and then you're an elder. Um, but like death or there's no finality, there's no final, there's no end stop, there's no end really. You just hop over again. And sometimes you kind of go through the circle to get to the other side. And like, so that would be, we would conceptualize that as like um, the spirit world or the fourth world, like, like ancestral spaces. So that when you reemerge on the other side, um, an elder or sorry, a child is held in the same regard as an elder would be in that their tongue is ancestral. They had just come from, you know, the, uh, the sky world or the space of creation, um, you know, where, at least in my stories, where Sky Woman comes from and built Turtle, Turtle Island by reach, having muskrat dig down um, to build, place a, you know, a mound of mud on the turtle's back so she could stay on. And so that circle, it, life and death, is also our cyclicity of time in that past, present, and future are colonial concepts um, because they're always intersecting, interwoven. And now to get to the COVID, <laughs> I think we all kind of felt that when we, even still now, um, you know, when you know, a day felt like two years long and then you would be like, it's the hell is December? Like, when the hell did we have Easter? <laughs> I don't remember Thanksgiving. Um, so like a, a year felt like a day and a day felt like a year. <laughs> and I think we all got to experience the kind of, false linearity of time um because nine to five the only person who can say this to me is dolly parton as long as she has the nails <laughs> the nine to five is just a capitalistic invention um it's a, an infant term um it's an infant concept of time mm. whereas when you think of um, like even too, like my elders say, when you step on a foot of land or a piece of land, like you're simultaneously experiencing past, present, and future. Um, so say if you look at something like a witness tree, if you've ever been to the south of the U.S., southern U.S., these trees are just like riddled with bullets um, from the civil wars, and they're still living, and they become living archives, and they're present in the contemporary, you can see them in the now, and they hold all these bullet holes, they're riddled with all these diseases, um, but they're still, they're holding history in them, and they will outlive us, um, so long as they're not clear cut. And you're experiencing time simultaneously, past, present, and future, right there, looking at that tree. Same thing with water, you know, it holds memories, it knows how to dissolve things, it remembers how to dissolve things. Um, Frozen 2, if you've ever seen that film, it's really good at explaining it, um, that water has memory and you know, it, it, ha it holds the same thing past and it's in the present and again, hopefully will outlive us. So I think when it comes to storying, that just comes naturally to me. Um, if you've ever sat around with a group of my aunties, if you've ever visited my res, come over to my auntie's house. Uh, everyone was sitting around at a table drinking red rose tea and bannock, and the women, and some, sometimes the men join, but it's mostly the women will talk, and they'll be like, I'm going to tell you a story, but to tell you this story, I have to go back to the beginning, <laughs> and sometimes that beginning is like their great, great, great grandmother, and they return to it, and so I tell you seven stories to get to that story, I guess exactly like I'm doing right now. <laughs> I'm telling you why this, the narrative cyclical, or the time feels weird. Um, to get to that one story, then they'll tell you stories of where they think the story is going to go. And I guess I was just trained like that, you know, from an ideological or, um, you know, an indigenous way of being. 
knowing that from my sweat lodges, that was just kind of the teachings that we got that elder is child and vice versa. And you, nothing ever ends. You just kind of return um, as a human, but as the natural landscapes around us. And the stories that these women would tell me, like I'll tell you one, but I got to tell you way before. I'm going to start at the beginning. Um, I think that just came naturally to me as a writer as well, in that I think this comes for a lot of writers when, in terms of when it comes to narrative is that the imposition of time is really of very little relevance. Um, because when we're telling you stories, sometimes we have to interweave trickster stories that are like built into characters, like Johnny experiencing the end of the world on the back of a Thunderbird. Um, and sometimes they're futuristic and thinking like where this is going to end or end up or where it's going to go or flourish or die. And so I think like the circle, everything is cyclical and everything intersects and it's messy and it interweaves rather than a hierarchical model that I think you know, um, Western storytelling methods have or Western's relational methods have where like humans at the top and everything else is down here. So I guess, yeah, it always just kind of comes back to the circle really. Um, and for me, at least my people's the medicine wheels that we have, it's like the circle, but it intersects. Um, so I guess, yeah, it always comes back to that. It comes back to the sweat lodge for me. What's the longest way to get to the answer? But I guess I'm becoming my aunties. <laughs> no, it was very, it was meta. You did exactly what, you know, you were circling around. Um, so I've got another question here. Um, stick with it because it's a, it's a bit circly. So Love we've that. been slowly introduced uh, to the gay community in television over the years, slowly mm -hmm. and sedately so we don't startle and run away. And then along came RuPaul and now your character Johnny kind of shot at us from a cannon and we're loving. People are so real and their stories are so interesting, touching, vis visceral, ferocious. What has been people's reaction to the Indian glitter princess? Can we get more? Is there more to this story? <laughs> the reaction has been wild, especially after Canada Reads. <coughs> Excuse me, I was choking on my own water. After Canada Reads, uh, you know, I'd get these messages from, um, you know, like elderly book clubs um, who would read Johnny Appleseed. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I got an email. This is going to be very, they're going to read me for Phil. <laughs> they're going to be like, this was terrible. How dare you? And actually, it was amazing. Um, like, I think, that, again, I was saying the very personal became universal. So that was so much of them were drawn to the, the relationship between Johnny and his grandmother and found such solace in that. Um, and maybe they found tools to connect with, you know, people in their lives who may be queer or maybe not be queer, uh, or may just be odd in the queer sense. Um, but also like rethinking connectivity across distances. Um, again, this was again in the pandemic. Um, and thinking about how to keep connected when, you know, you're in different provinces or, you know, different nations or, you know, one's in the US and one's in Canada. And so like the reception was actually overwhelmingly very great. Um, minus, like I always say my kink in life is to have a glass of wine and then read my Goodreads reviews. <laughs> because some of the Goodreads, you know, they weren't happy, but I think what it speaks to, like as this, as this person's noting with like RuPaul um, and, you know, the kind of introduction to, you know, queerness, as we might call it, or, or the LGBT community, but also intersectional LGBTQ, like mm -hmm. indigenous people who are queer, black queerness or transness. Uh, it's, it has become mainstream, I would say. Uh, and I think a lot of that is owed to the works of RuPaul's Drag Race, but it's also become so placated. <laughs> it's lost its teeth a little bit, mm -hmm. um, which I think is good. Because it's you know it allows more it allows people to like learn and you know introspect. But what I think what we're seeing on those TVs and we're reading in these books is like these are small semblances. Mm -hmm. uh, you know there are still rampant youth indigenous queer suicides across Turtle Island happening right now today, um, due in part to you know ingrained homophobia and transphobia on reservations that comes from residential schools. Uh, and I attribute a lot of that to the work of Indigenous men and men in general, not doing the work of reconceptualizing or rethinking, and I guess I'll be specific here in terms of residential schools, the Indigenous men not thinking about 
how same-sex sexual assault affected their idea of what they might call gay or queer now. Um, you know, as we work through this with, you know, with uh, the TRC and whatnot, and focus on heterosexuality or, and sexual self from an advantage point, uh, and men more specifically, indigenous women are dying <laughs> and two-spirit people are dying across Turtle Island. So the Wileys are joyful and they're beautifully queer and viciously queer. I think it's one of the, um, the adjectives given in that. I love that, um, but I also think while we read these and we think about these and we um, imagine these, we also need to be cognizant of the literal, not just the literary, that is happening around us too. Um, and to not think about this as the, this, as much as I love him, as the only kind of representation, the only experience, um, or as the, the only really of two-spiritness because yeah, Indigenous youth suicides are very rampant across across mm -hmm. all of Turtle Island, um, but at the I guess at the end of the day, I, I am very grateful that you know this the queerness or specifically um, two spirit stories like Johnny have come to be able to become mainstream and you know to enter the realm of television and to win something like Canada Reads because I think the good outweighs the problematic or bad in that you know folks get to learn what spirit is um but also indigenous folks get to see themselves and be like and really kind of understand concepts that they may not have been privy to uh due to the loss you know, of cultural genocide but the language loss from that as well um so i just kind of hope it's not i just hope it's a small spark in kind of the, the flaming of language revitalization for for these youth i think problematic is good i mean problematic hopefully would make you think, why is it a problem? Like, why why do I think this is a problem? And how can I interrogate that uh, some more and figure out why I feel that way? Um, and, you know, uh, I think part of maybe what you were saying is, you know, don't just take Johnny as like, okay, now I understand, but as an entry point, uh, yeah. like a door to walk through to to start understanding more about this this culture and this topic and this identity. Yeah, exactly. And like specifically with days like Orange Shirt Day coming up, mm -hmm. um, like, yeah, use that. To maybe think about, use Johnny as a way to think about like where are like are the two spirit youth in these yeah. presentations, right? Do you have any thoughts about, you know, our very first Truth and Reconciliation Day coming up? <laughs> I mean, I'm excited for it. Yeah. Uh, I have my orange shirt ready, my or kind of my orange everything ready. Um, and yeah, I'm excited for us to like, naturally take the day off and like think about hopefully people think about it and not yeah. just as a day to kind of not watch television, which i hope yeah. they do <laughs> but rest take some time to yourself um and if you love johnny use it as a, a window you know, or a key to open up what comes next right mm -hmm. um for orange shirt day um, for those youth in residential schools who are being unearthed for the youth who are still with us now and need help or you know need us to help garner attention for drink clean drinking water on the reservations and also use him as a window to sometimes question like when you're at spaces that are um you know indigenous led or indigenous focused like where are the indigenous women uh, where are the indigenous two-spirit people in this space and i think we can all ask that you don't have to be indigenous to be like i think an, an indigenous woman should be here talking about you know um own like body rights or reproductive rights um so yeah i would say like let johnny also maybe be help you find a voice to, to question spaces that are very necessarily lacking hmm. okay i've got one last one for you and uh, it's about your writing method um so uh our customer is asking when i heard you read from johnny appleseed at times it felt like i was listening to poetry beautiful and poignant. And I wonder if you sometimes write poetry and then prose. She says, or I apologize, this person says, I do that sometimes, especially when I'm having trouble writing a scene. Would love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> oh, I love that. I know I haven't called myself a poet in a long time. I haven't really written any poetry since Full Metal. But what I do do, um, a weird way to say it. what I do, uh, in lieu, and that's like Dr. Seuss, I'm just going to stop trying to, what I do, 
<laughs> is uh, I'm not a, much of a person who like sets time every day to write because um, I teach full time too. Um, I have a very, very energetic dog. Uh, and by the end of the day, I'm pretty tired from that. But I am a voracious reader. I love to read. Do I have any of my books here? I do not. They're all in my office. Yeah, what are you um, reading right now? <laughs> so right now I'm like reading for school uh, or for to teaching. I teach, I'm teaching creative writing intro of 150 students. That's very wild. Uh, and then I'm teaching a grad course on two-spirit literatures and cultures. Um, but the last book that I read for pleasure was uh, my dear friend Billy Ray Belcourt's A Minor Chorus, which just ca came out, I believe, and is up for the Giller Prize now. Very excited for him, but I don't know if you can see this. Um, they're all very dog-eared. I feel like I'm an influencer, you know, I like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I like to dog-ear my books, and like I, they're full of like little hearts and notations that I make in them. Um, because it becomes part of my thinking process uh, when it comes to you know sitting down to actually write, as well as moving to the world. Um, I something that sometimes I'll witness something or read something or feel something, and so I have. Um, I'm not sure you know if they exactly say, but let's see if I can find it here. I have this little. I kind of can't see it, but it says novel ideas, and it's just like a super long list of notations that I make. Uh, of a small little like maybe poetic lines or two that come to me and I call them like I call them anchors for myself so that when I come to the computer and you know I can't really think of what to do I just like, kind of take one of these put it on the page and I'm like immediately reeled back to that moment when I was like experiencing this or feeling this and then for me I can just start writing from there um, so they're they're kind of like little little seedlings I guess I carry or anchors um, and I do that I do that again with books that I write or read. Uh, I'll take down passages that I loved or things that I disagreed with. So I think disagreement is also very generative. Um, and again, things that I have experienced or noticed, or you know, I, you, sometimes you like witness something that's so strange and odd, and like the weirdest line comes to you, uh, or even just the sensation of like, well, I was feeling that moment. It's kind of like mini journaling, I guess. And then yeah, I just bring that to the page when I need to do it. And from there, things unfurl. So it's a very, it's kind of like collage work almost. Um, so I kind of work, like I'll work here in the one scene here, and like one scene is an ending or towards the end. And then you kind of just kind of like keep filling in the pockets. And then when you kind of come to that end, what I love to do is print all the pages out and then like put them together like a little, like a little clock that you have to rebuild. You take the clock apart and you like have put it back together. So that's basically my writing process. Um, another thing I tell my students, <laughs> something I also like to do, uh, which I find it is like a kind of creative exercise, is the next time you're in an Uber, um, when they ask you like what you do, just tell like the tiniest little white lie. <laughs> Pick a different profession or like elaborate <laughs> creatively on what you did that day and then like have a conversation around that it's like method acting um so I find that when I'm trying to think of a character I will sometimes <laughs> use my uber method um and like method act as that character and be like you know that this person asked me a very interesting question as I'm pretending to be like I just came back from working at say the steel mill uh and then I like, write those down too um so it's a fun way <laughs> of like acting in the world uh, or like embodying your character I guess I would say and the last little bit is like dreams are really important to me um, I have the maybe this is just like my strange uh, <laughs> sleeping ability but I have very intense dreams all the time I always had um, and as soon as like I have a dream I have to, like, it'll wake me up or if I wake up from it I usually write it down um, in my notepad on my notepad or in my notes app uh, and use it. I find they're very generative because again, it's like the unconscious. Remember, we're saying you put language to this feeling. It's very a strange realm to pull from uh, and put into story too. So, yeah, taking notes constantly, reading, um, using your dreams, and then method acting as your character to embody them helps you kind of get into the skin of that character. Amazing. I don't know if you have time for one more. Um, let's do it. Yeah. It's not so much a question, but, um, so one of my colleagues, she saw you in an interview where you mentioned the idea of your own medicine bag and how to use it. And it's, 
it was really wonderful. And I'd wonder if you could just speak to that for a moment and maybe share that because I think it's such a lovely idea. It's something everyone could really benefit from. Yeah, so like the medicine bags that I, I have a medicine bag that I carry, um, what we do with it, it's actually for like protection um, and also guiding. And you would use it in like ceremony or you would use it in ceremonial ways of like smudging every day if you wanted to do that. Um, to talk to something we might call like a higher power or God, which we call creator um, or Gichi Manitou as would be known in Crete. And yeah, so it's a medicine bag. It's usually from deer hide, smoked deer hide. So it smells, chef's kiss, smells so good. Um, and it's usually, so it's usually beaded. Uh, so you can either be usually your gifted one. Um, and so someone can gift you this and they usually put all four of the medicines in. So sage, cedar, tobacco, and sweet grass. And sometimes very personal little like knickknacks, I guess I would say, or uh, tchotchkes, uh, or objects that are very meaningful to that person to give to you. Um, so you're not supposed to really ever open it um, unless you're in need of to, like a medicine like tobacco, something you put down uh, as a way of thanking. And so, yeah, I carry it usually kind of with me everywhere, every day where I go. When I'm at home, I don't usually, um, but it's usually tucked away somewhere on my body. Um, just as a means of guidance and protection. Um, so like that becomes my everyday use for it. But also when praying specifically at the Bow River here, uh, when I was writing this, when I was writing Making Love with the Land, I was down there a lot, um, making notes and writing. You got to hear a small scene of me being at that river. And again, this is isolation, lockdown. And I missed home so much, which is Manitoba. So actually, like I was taught, like when you put medicine down in the Bow River, moves through Saskatchewan and actually ends up in Manitoba. So when you put tobacco down in the Bow River, you are sending medicine home. So I would use my medicine bag for that, uh, just as a way of saying thanks to the relations of which I was in that were plenty, the Bow River being you know a major source of that. And then also to send a little bit of love home through the river paths too. Uh, my colleague is with me. I'm, her name's Tanya. I think she's just going to pop on for a second because I think she wants to ask, uh, Maybe experience. Sure. <laughs> Hi, Joshua. How are you? Oh, hi, Fanny. How are you? I'm well. Um, I heard you in an interview talk about more of a figurative medicine bag, something that you would carry with you that you would put in all of your, your happy thoughts, um, and events that made you feel good about yourself, um, times when people were kind to you, when they could have, that could have gone either way, but they were kind, they chose to be kind, and you could take those out when you needed it, when you needed that kind of medicine for yourself, when you were feeling bad, or if you were, you know, things weren't going your way and you could take that out and kind of examine them and enjoy them again and come around to a place where you felt better about things. And it, it like, I guess I was kind of thinking like, what could you tell a kid, you know, who's struggling at school? And if they have a medicine bag, even if it's figurative and they can put all the things in there that will kind of rescue them when they need rescuing. It's such a great, um, you know, feeling it really stuck it resonated with me I, I don't remember what interview I saw you telling it about but I think that's something that that every single person in the world could benefit from people who struggle with mental illness people who don't struggle with mental illness it's a great way to carry those things with you and be able to take them out and and you know know that you're going to be okay because you have these great things in your medicine bag you can fix yourself to some degree mm. with all those wonderful things yeah, Is I can't recall. Well with you? Am, am I, did I imagine it? Did I dream this? <laughs> <laughs> I can't recall myself talking about that, but um, I, I, would, well, to, I would turn my computer, but um, here, let me see for one second. I'm just going to grab a couple things. I'm going to mute my, or stop the video, but I'm still here. I keep telling people about it. So <laughs> if ever if ever it gets back to you from some other source, you know, it's because I've been telling everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, where am I here? Let's grab maybe one more. I'll hear this one for sure. So I don't have like a metaphorical medicine bag or a figurative one, but well, I have an actual one. Um, but I also kind of build my house like a terrarium almost of items. Um, which was very helpful to me. So I have this like knickknack shelf just right here, but my office is so messy over there. <laughs> I was like, that's where I put all my books from teaching. Um, but uh, yeah, I love to fill it up. 
It's full of memories and like objects that were given to me and photos and beadwork <laughs> and paintings and notes that I was given. Then I'm like, ever having a bad time, I come to this little corner and just like sit with like a, basically an archive of my life, really. And so like, yeah, that becomes kind of my medicinal space, I guess I would say. And like, I can show you a few. Um, so I have this like piece of petrified wood that I found with my father um, and I was four. And so I've kept it. I, I took it when I moved out of Manitoba. <laughs> I was like, I need this um, because it reels me right back into a space like that. Um, I have this bison tooth that I was given from a dear friend in East End. Uh, so it's fossilized bison tooth um, out of Southern Saskatchewan. Uh, a dear, dear friend of mine gave this to me. Um, and it just it means so much to me to kind of have a piece of the Cree in our history uh, right in my hands to hold when I just need to like be held by something other than a person. Uh, and then I have this little rock. Um, so the Joshua tree that I wrote or I was reading to you today, um, that river space that we were at, this was a, there's a scene in that essay where we talk about plucking out a river or plucking out a rock from that river um, to kind of signal an ending, but a transformation. And this is just a plain rock, but that probably means very, it's very dear to me. Um, so for me, like maybe I, I don't recall calling if I did speak about that, but I do have a space in my home that I can always return to that is like, full of story and full of memory and every single person I've ever loved and touched rushes back in here with me when I need it. Um, so maybe like I would say, build a little refuge for yourself, even if it's full of things that look and mean like nothing to people. Um, little rock, like fossilized wood or a rock or a, a tooth. Um, it's like again even like we were saying earlier focusing on the menu it's like a wound or a scar I get this like these little things are the cold years and years and historic years of stories right um thinking about even where this was a rock like this would come from how it was whittled down to this and why it was there in that moment uh and what it means to me personally and emotionally right um so that might be my advice is to craft a medicine bag of your home of your space mm -hmm. right Joshua, thank you so much. I think that's a great way to finish off tonight. Do you have any, do you want to direct people to anything? You know, obviously check out your new book, Making Love with the Land. <laughs> yes, check it out. I'll, I'll be doing some events. Um, so my website should be updated within the next week, a week and a half. So I'll be back in Ontario a few more times this year. Uh, I hope I can see you um, in person if able to. Uh, and I'll also be doing a lot of online events as well. So if you want to hear me read from Making Love with the Land and, and again, ask me more questions, you're more than welcome to. I'd love to see you there. Um, so check out my website, joshuawhitehead.ca uh, or check my social medias. That's where I post those too, which is at jwhitehead204. Uh, also just type into the chat because I can never get rid of my Manitoba area code. So it's been my number <laughs> handle in all my social media, um, which I post everything there as well. So if you're interested in the book, come check me out. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We are so appreciative for your time tonight. We all really loved having sharing this time with you, sharing this space with you and getting to learn more about yourself and your characters and everything. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I very much appreciate it. <laughs> Good night, everyone. All my love. Till next time. See you in the future.